In the early 1960s, a ferment began among some people who were interested in expanding personal freedom and possibly creating a truly free society, one much freer than any that exists at the present time. This ferment, heavily influenced by the writings of Ayn Rand, grew to become the modern libertarian movement. One of the earliest libertarian projects was Free Isles, which was an effort by some Southern California freedom seekers to explore the possibility of founding a libertarian new country, perhaps on an island somewhere. One of the participants in the Free Isles project was a unique man who called himself El Rey, later changed to Rayo. The Free Isles project never got beyond the talking stage. When it petered out, Rayo began looking elsewhere for ways to expand freedom, especially his own personal freedom. He decided that land mobility was a promising idea, so he moved out of his apartment into a camper mounted on a pickup truck. For several years, he lived in his camper and later at campsites deep in the mountains and forests, up and down the west coast of North America. That will be the focus of this podcast, Rayo's ideas and the freedom strategy that he brought to the forefront, Vanu. Financial independence. Country shopping. Van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vaughn Podcast. And welcome to the inaugural episode of the Vaughn Podcast. I'm Shane and I'm Kyle. The website is vanupodcast.com. And for some of you who may not have heard of this concept, Vanu is spelled V as in victory, O, and as in Nancy, U, vanupodcast.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, what, what you heard in the beginning was a portion of the introductory chapter of Rayo's book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom. So before we get started, I think it's best to begin with uh, short introductions of who we are. So my name is Shane, and my main, my main website is libertyunderattack.com. I do a podcast over there and write articles on a wide range of subjects, main, mostly focused on anti-political solutions. Uh, first and foremost, I'm an anarchist, but also classify myself as a voluntarist. Hopefully, uh, after Kyle and I update this freedom strategy to you know modern times, I will be able to call myself a Vonuwin as well. Uh, so Kyle, why don't you go ahead with uh, your introduction? Sure. I'm commonly known as uh, Kyle Reardon uh, within the alternative media. Um, I'm a blogger, podcaster, and even a videographer back in the day. I started The Last Bastille blog back in 2011. And uh, before that, I uh, even going far back as 2009, I used to have a YouTube channel that had amassed well in excess of 127,000 total upload views. Uh, so I like to think I've been around the block a little bit with regard to the alternative media. And um, at the conclusion of Liberty Under Attacks as the Direct Action series, um, I was on there uh, as, as a guest co-host, and I had mentioned that I had changed my political ideology recently, and I had announced there for the very first time publicly, and I'll just remind everybody uh, this go-around, that uh, I do consider myself a Vonuin. And we'll get to uh, a little bit here what exactly that term means. Indeed, yes, uh, yes, we definitely will. And you probably are at this point. Uh, you probably are like one of the only Vonu, like self-identified Vonuans out there. Uh, so uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess we're we're kind of paving the path. Uh, you know, we're trying to get uh, you know Vonu back uh, uh, back into uh, some people's ears and hopefully some stra- some more freedom strategies that people can adopt uh, to find uh, you know to increase their own personal freedom. So uh, you know, Kyle, I've been I've been really excited to get this uh, get this launched ever since uh, I had the idea. Uh, now, obviously, uh, for those who came here from Liberty Under Attack, uh, you know that uh, I've done a lot of work on solutions to the problem of tyranny, and you know Kyle has too. And speaking for myself, none has, have been as appealing as Vanu. Additionally, Vanu was never all that popular of a strategy, but what little popularity it, popularity it had has kind of been lost, and it is our hope that this podcast will bring it back to the forefront and create more Vanuists. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm most looking forward to discussing the action part of Vanu, and I'm sure you are too, Kyle, but uh, we do have a, at least a few episodes of Groundwork to lay first, uh, or else this uh, won't really make a whole lot of sense, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that, and you know, I, I, I guess we'll also do a little bit of comparing and contrasting in, in a little bit here, maybe in some future episodes, regarding, regarding other libertarian strategies like agorism, but unfortunately, uh, we in some ways, we have to start right from the ground level and really revive uh, Vanu as, as, as a libertarian strategy. So with this inaugural episode, we're, we're starting from the very, very beginning. 
Exactly, exactly. This isn't something like, you know, voluntarism or, uh, I don't know, like... Uh, the syndicalist or or syndicalist yeah or <laughs> or agorism where you you don't really have to like if you start talking about that subject most people in like the anarchist media are pretty familiar with those but with vanu yeah it is kind of necessary to kind of build you know start from the start from the ground floor and you know work up to to the action because yeah like i said it won't make a whole lot of sense and uh and you won't get the the full vanu experience so without uh without this background and there's also some interesting history here uh, that we'll cover in these first uh, first few episodes, and so for those of you who like libertarian history, oh boy, you're in for you're in for it here. Uh, <laughs> so let, so let's uh, go ahead and provide uh, provide that background. So Rio became disgusted with reformism, uh, or you know the political means, and uh, was seeking what direct action he could do in order to become as invulnerable to coercion as he possibly could be. His formulation of Vani was was his answer. His early experiments in Wilderness Vanu were what he focused on, but he also realized that City Vanu was possible. But uh, uh, his own personal preferences, yeah, he preferred a country mouse to city rat, as it were. He shared his experiences through a variety of libertarian newsletters uh, through the 1960s and 70s until he chose to disappear in 1974. Some of those articles were made into his book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom. No one within any libertarian circles know for certain what has become of him since his infamous disappearance. Uh, so I'm going to read, this is uh, uh, page 107 of his book. Uh, you can find that uh, PDF uh, out there. I'll put that in the show notes, but let me get this open real quick like. And for the listeners can also follow along. Uh, you can get Vanu, the search for personal freedom, for free at tinyurl.com slash Vanu Rayo, tinyurl.com slash Vanu Rayo, and uh, follow along with us here. Thank you. I didn't have that uh, handy, so that's why, that's why you're here, Kyle. One of the many reasons you're here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this, yeah, again, page 107 is titled Epilogue, The Disappearance. Quote, if you want to get in touch with Rayo after reading the preceding chapters, I'm sorry to say that I can't help you. Rayo disappeared in 1974. I don't even know whether he is now dead or alive. We can only speculate about what might have happened to him. Perhaps one of his underground constructions fell in on him, or maybe he was eaten by a bear. Or he could have abandoned Vanu and returned to a conventional lifestyle. Or maybe he moved overseas. Or perhaps he just decided that he would be freer if he broke off communication and he is still out there in the mountains, living free. If it were anyone else, I would guess that this complete silence over so many years must mean that he is dead. But Rayo is different, because his goal always was to become invisible to coercers, meaning mainly government. He might have come to believe that this required that he become invisible to everyone. I know of only one tantalizing clue that has a bearing on this mystery, Rayo's last known letter. This is dated February 14, 1974. In it, he writes to his correspondent, quote, My thinking has undergone major changes in the last several months on interfacing, alternate economics, or interrelations in general. I, too, am becoming very dubious as to the value of all libertarian club involvements. We do not intend to use the libertarian club in the future as an avenue for gaining non-anonymous friends or associates, end quote. Since that time, from or concerning Rayo, no one I know has heard one word or the least rumor. He has completely disappeared. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, there you have it. Kyle was actually, you know, I was, I was kind of curious. And one of the articles we'll cover here in a moment, uh, it actually mentions Rayo's age at the, at the time where, where this guy met him. And uh, uh, if my math is correct, and I, this is some pretty simple math, so I'd say it is, uh, he'd be about 82 years old today. So, I mean, it's, it's honestly not impossible that he, you know, he's still around and kicking out there you know, uh, uh, somewhere, somewhere in the world. Uh, sure, it's, it's probably unlikely, but uh, stranger things have happened. And as was mentioned in, the, uh, in that, that epilogue that I just read, uh, yeah, <laughs> Rayo was uh, quite a formidable, formidable individual. So uh, he, uh, it's, I guess it's possible he may be alive. What do you think, Kyle? Well, I, I like to be optimistic when it comes to certain things like these. And so, you know, unless some sort of emergency happened to him or his heart gave out or, or it's some people have speculated in some of their articles regarding what happened to Rayo, unless there was an emergency of some kind, my own personal subjective preference would be that uh, he's, he very well might be alive today, and that's what I prefer to go with in terms of speculation. Yeah, yeah, same here. I, I hope, like, it, you know, I mean, he, he talked about, he, he wasn't, uh, and we'll get more into this, he wasn't like an indigenous or prim primitivist and just disregard technology altogether, so who knows, maybe he'll come across this podcast. <laughs> Probably not, but, but anyways, we, we can hope, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. And who knows? I mean, maybe he would be willing to uh, go public again. I mean, you never know. Miracles do happen every once in a while. And that that would just tickle me pink something oh, fierce God, because yeah. <laughs> I changed my political ideology or shall I say anti-political ideology from uh, being a polyarchist uh, to to being of the new one because because of his book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom. That's how much of of a significant well, impact it had on my life. And, you know, one of the things I'm well known for in the alternative media, is, as my readers and others tell me, is I do book reports. There's, and it's well in excess of like 150 some odd books I've written about, books that I've read from cover to cover. So when I say that after reading Rayo's book, where he is birthing the concept of Vanu, that I changed my anti political ideology based on this one book where he birthed this concept. Yeah, I hope that kind of gets across the listeners that that's how powerful I think his uh, his content is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you're not and, and I would say I, I haven't read all of them, but I would say probably for the most part and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, at, at the most, it's kind of an indifferent like, OK, there's some valuable things in this book that I read. Uh, but I think probably for the most part, uh, uh, your articles are, or your, your book reports are kind of harsh. Uh, so you would, so if this one came out with, you know, like, uh, you know, a, a good review, I think that really does say something. Well, it's not, not just a good review. I changed my anti-political well, ideology yeah, yeah. because of it. So it's even going beyond just, uh, this book is actually mostly okay, which I do do for, you know, a handful, uh, for, for a bunch of books, even, you know, the library page on my blog are all books I do recommend. And there's like well over, what was it? 20, 30 of them at least just on different topics of one kind or another. But I didn't change my ideology based on those books. I just thought, oh, okay, subject matter, single issue, okay, whatever. But but Vanu, the search for personal freedom, I changed my outlook on things in a pretty drastic way because I think Rayo had something very unique to offer that as much as I love Sam Konkin, uh, I think is can actually help a lot more people out than even Agorism quite possibly could. Yeah. I mean, that's how much I'm I'm getting behind this. Yeah, and I would, I would, I would tend to agree. I would definitely tend to agree. So, uh, the legacy. I mean, as this conversation has kind of gone, I mean, the, the legacy he has left is rather quite impressive. For it suggests that lifestyle changes are amongst the most potent and efficacious forms of direct action available to you, largely because they are voluntary to begin with. So, and, and you mentioned agorism, I and mean, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I could, you know, listen, like name Derek Bros, for example. But I suppose this this could be similar to someone adopting, you know, purely like a purely agorist lifestyle. Uh, you know that that major lifestyle change where where everything is you know in the in the black and gray markets. Uh, so I, I guess there there uh, that might be one example of, of something similar. Uh, or you know like uh, uh like someone you're pretty close to, Kyle Alex Ansari, who mm -hmm. uh who you know he changed his lifestyle and now you know he's uh you know doing the off grid living thing. But but what's what's unique about Vaughn, and we'll, we'll get more into this as as we go on. Vanu kind of uh incorporates both of those things into this overarching strategy. Uh, this this cohesive you know uh, this, this cohesive as well as adaptable uh, strategy you know for, for finding freedom now so any thoughts on that before I move forward yeah I, I would just say that in many ways and and later on and in, in some future podcasts we'll go into more detail on this but I do think that for those people who are familiar with with agorism if, if you're at least familiar with that that in some ways the one critique I would make of it is that it is very it is very strict. And in a lot of ways, that can be very beneficial for some people and then for others, not so much. What I think is particularly valuable about Vanu is that it is quite flexible, but in a good way. It's flexible in such a way where it doesn't violate your principles, because unfortunately, most political and some even a few anti-political activities where they veer off into being flexible, like reformism plus, uh, then the flexibility actually leads to a violation of principle. What is very unique about Vanu, and I can't stress this enough for the listeners, what is uniquely valuable by Vanu that I have never seen anywhere else is that you can be flexible in terms of uh, tactics, methodology, etc., but without violating your principles. I have never seen that ev everywhere, and that, I think, is what's uniquely valuable about Vanu. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, so we're we're about fifteen minutes into the podcast, and and you know, I'm I'm sure like, I'm sure that this this is discussion so far has been intriguing for a lot of folks. But, uh, you know, we're we're we really haven't defined like you know what Vanu actually is. So I, I'd like to 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 do that right now. So Vanu, uh, it's a contraction of voluntary, not vulnerable. Uh, so simply put, Vanu is about becoming as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible. 
and it is distinctly different from liberty and freedom. Now, this term was suggested by Roberta and Tom of Preform, and one, one note on that uh, as an aside, a number of folks and publications are mentioned uh, in this book, whether it be in the footnotes or, or just, you know, in the, in the actual articles, that, uh, you know, I've not been able to locate on the internet at all. Uh, so that said, if you found this podcast, you know, doing a Google search or something, uh, I mean, it's, it's likely that you're, you're, you're kind of familiar with the subject. So if any of you listening have any editions of, of, of these publications, any at all, I mean, I, I, you know, just kind of, you know, a wide grab here, uh, Innovator, Free Trade, Libertarian Connection, or Vanu Life, uh, we would be extremely interested uh, in acquiring a digital or physical copy of those. Um, you know, top since the subject of this podcast, uh, I mean, a lot of discussions were had in those publications, so it could be highly valuable uh, uh, for us here. Uh, <laughs> right, and, and just for the listeners to keep in mind, those publications you listed off, please keep in mind, everybody, those publications, those different issues that came out were all throughout the 1960s and early 70s. So when Shane here is making the request that if any of you who are old enough happen to have any hard copies of that so we can digitize it and, and get, those, get those originals, even though we still have the content in, in, in another way, uh, that, that would be awesome. But unfortunately, yeah, they're not on the Internet because these publications were part of the original alternative media before the Internet. So actually, there's also a little bit of a history here regarding the technological end of the alternative media as well. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, and yeah, we would we would certainly digitize these and, and make them available for, uh, for for everyone else. So uh, yeah, we definitely appreciate that uh, if that does, uh, you know, if that's something that you can do, uh, we would certainly appreciate it. So uh, freedom and freedom is the absence of a absence of or invulnerability to coercion. Uh, liberty is the general exemption uh, to coercion. So that's just a little little bit of a difference there between uh, liberty, freedom, and vanu. He goes a little more in depth. Uh, uh, in his book. Uh, but Kyle, do you have uh, anything to add there? Yeah, just for people to keep in mind that, that Rayo did define the terms freedom, liberty, and Vanu kind of noticeably different, right? So you have, and just to reiterate, because this is important, we're defining our terms here just like any good uh, philosophers and just sci even scientists do. Uh, yes, you have your absence of coercion. Then you have your general exemption from coercion. And a lot of that is more legalistic in some ways. And then finally, you have your, as is the whole point of Vanu, an invulnerability to coercion. And these differences are rather important. Indeed. Indeed, they are. And uh, um, I guess the, the <laughs> you know, the, this is such it's such a pioneering, you know, book to begin with, because he's, he's kind of like, you know, generating this new word Vanu. And uh, there, there's a chart in the book, which uh, there, there's a chart in the book, and there's also a, a list that you put together, Kyle, which I think is, is, is pretty valuable. I'll put images of both of those in the show notes. Um, but, uh, but Kyle, you put together a list on, you know, grammatical variations. Uh, so uh, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and, and cover that for us? Sure. This is basically uh, my attempt to work off that chart that Rayo himself put together and present it more in the form of a sentence for each term. So please keep in mind this is an issue of grammatical variations of the of both the word vanu and its again its grammatical variations. So vanu can be variously defined as vanu the condition of invulnerability to coercion, vanu the action of achieving an invulnerability to coercion, vanu the quality of an invulnerability to coercion. Vanu er having comparatively more invulnerability to coercion. Vanuence in the process of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Vanuin one who has an invulnerability to coercion. Vanuist one who advocates for an invulnerability to coercion, such as what I'm doing tonight. Vanuism, the advocacy of an invulnerability to coercion, which is the whole point of this podcast series. Vanum, V-O-N-U-U-M, there's actually two U's in there. Vanuem, uh, vanuum, excuse me, vanuum, the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion. Vanu me, V-O-N-U-M-Y, Vanu me, or me, 
uh, the art of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. And lastly, Vonu Mur, V O N U M E R, Vonu Mur, one skilled at an invulnerability to coercion. So that are, those are the grammatical variations of, of Vanu. Yes, yes, they, they, they definitely are. And you, me you mentioned uh, just a moment ago, uh, you know, as far as the, the, the I guess, the, the, the variations, the, the ones that uh, Rayo kind of pioneered, and I should have, shouldn't have closed this page in the book. Uh, okay, yeah, so, there, so there's, you know, invulnerability, invulnerability to coercion, general exemption from coercion, and absence of coercion. Mm -hmm. And he, he kind of lays out, like, condition of, action of achieving, quality of, comparative, comparatively more, et cetera, et cetera. And he kind of compares Vani with the, the terms that, would, that, that exist for, you know, liberty and freedom in those same contexts. Uh, so like I said, I'll, I'll definitely put that uh, in the uh, show notes uh, for this uh, for this production and uh, next Kyle you're, you're, <laughs> you do a lot with uh, you know you know legal definitions and things so uh, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you uh, so so what Vanu is not is also important so we, we know what Vanu is but uh, what Vanu is not is also important so uh, why don't you break down you know uh, sovereignty uh, liberty uh, and uh, you know etc uh, etc et cetera, et cetera. Well, this is important to get our, you know, to, to define our terms and all that. And sometimes what's good is not just, as you said, not just what something is, but also kind of almost trying to tell people what it's not, uh, because sometimes people will confuse things, especially when they're being introduced to it for the first time. So here's what Vanu is not. So if we're going to look at sovereignty, I know a lot of um, anarchists and libertarians like to say, well, we're exercising our individual sovereignty. Ooh, that's, that's not good. Here's why I say that. Let's look at three 19th century legal dictionaries, and this is very short, but it'll get the point across. First one up is Ballantine's Law Dictionary. Sovereign is legally defined as, quote, a ruler, a king, the supreme power, in a government. Close quote. Oh, but one legal definition is not good enough, so let's go look at Bouvier's Law Dictionary. Uh, quote, a chief ruler with supreme power, one possessing sovereignty. It is also applied to a king or a magistrate with limited powers. Close quote. But of course, as these things go, maybe two is not enough, even though in some ways it is consistent with, with some other legal precedents regarding if you have like two witnesses or whatever. So let's do three just to cover our bases, shall we, everybody? Black's Law Dictionary. Quote, a chief, wait for it, a chief ruler with supreme power, a king or other ruler with limited power, close quote. So as you uh, folks can probably kind of tell, between Ballantine's, Bouvier's, and Black's Law Dictionaries, every single legal definition, without exception, without equivocation, says that if you declare yourself to be a sovereign, you are saying, literally and legally, that you consider yourself to be a ruler. <laughs> and that's significant because obviously, as anarchists are well known, and maybe you can kind of carry this a little further, but it basically means that uh, you imagine yourself having the right to rule over others. And, this, and then the significance of that, I think, is maybe better explained by you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, just, just taking, and we'll get into this next week as well. Um, but, uh, but you know, the, the, et the etymology of just, of just anarchy without rulers. So automatically, when you have, uh, a, I guess, uh, philosophy, ideology, uh, anarchy without rulers, uh, the term sovereignty doesn't really work. You can't say I'm an anarchist and I'm, you know, I'm exercising my sovereignty. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, you know, etymologically and also just, you know, uh, realistically, you know, it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, so yeah, I think you're, you're, you're definitely right there to point out that, yeah, there's, uh, there's some issues there with, with the term sovereignty, and that's something I know uh, Rayo, Rayo definitely kind of looked at. He examined all of these terms and, and kind of explained why he chose Vani when not, you know, liberty, freedom, sovereignty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and, and so sovereignty or sovereign, those two words, which, which are basically uh, virtually similar, they're loaded political terms. Let's just be really, really honest about what's going on here, mainly because, as I just read for everybody, each and every single, even 19th century legal definitions, each one, ruler, 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 every time, no exceptions. So, yeah, for all you guys who may have meant well, uh, maybe instead of saying sovereign, maybe just as a suggestion, you might want to consider another word like what I think you guys mean, like autonomy. 
that would be one 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 type of uh, word. Or you could join with the rest of us and promote Vanu. But hey, you know that's just me. Uh, let's see what else is Vanu yeah, and not. Let me let me let me let me yeah let me let me step in real quick because mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not like uh, what I I obviously you know uh, removed myself like I I wrote an article on the subject of why I'm not a libertarian anymore, um, and the, the the reason sovereignty is different is you know it's a political term it's you, you, like it, you know, this isn't something you can you can reappropriate for use uh, like as part of like a freedom strategy or a freedom label so to speak um, it, it, it's just not uh, so I wanted to kind of toss that in there real quick. Right, of course. And yes, yeah, so, so so when we're starting off the ground floor here by defining our terms like any good philosophers or scientists would, unfortunately, we do need to get at least to some degree into semantics because otherwise, in later uh, episodes of this series, when we get into more specific uh, you know, tactics and methods and, and talking shop and getting to like nitty gritty nuts and bolts type stuff, unfortunately, folks, if you don't understand this arguably more philosophical foundation, then everything else in terms of particular methods, everything ranging from country shopping to van nomadism and much more really won't matter if you don't understand this first. There actually is a, there are actually some basic things you need to understand first. So what else is Vanu not? Well, Vanu is actually not liberty. And there are some segments I, I guess maybe I should read yeah, from, uh, from Rayo's book. So let's, let's just kind of take this one by one. This is Rayo talking, quote, liberty depends upon laws and their interpretations, and so is easily destroyed. Vanu, while not necessarily illegal, depends upon reality, not legality, and so is more durable, close quote. And so let me just kind of explicate that a little bit. I think what Rayo was trying to kind of, kind of get across here is that it's not that it's it's that sometimes people and and we'll do a future episode on this regarding what Rayo himself called legal interstices. But what I'll say here, just because this is an introductory episode, is that there are many political activists of various kinds who just simply rely on, uh, well, as 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 Rayo himself called it, an, a general exemption from coercion. And that general exemption would be depending on, as Rayo put it, the interpretations of, of laws and so forth. And so, yeah, if you want to depend on the monolithic state for your 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 li you know, for your freedom, if if you will, then yeah, it's it's. I think I think the listeners can probably kind of see where this is going. We're relying upon lawyers and legalese to secure your freedom or liberty, either way. Is, is really not desirable, and I think that's what Rayo was kind of getting at. Let's look at another quote that further explains this. Quote, Vanu and liberty interact in various ways. Achievement of Vanu tends to increase liberty also. Vanu also fosters other Vanu. Large-scale use of liberty, on the other hand, tends to reduce liberty. A large degree of liberty, long continued, reduces vanu. Close quote. And, and if I if I could step in for for just a moment here, what he, what he's kind of explaining is, in, in the in the context of, of what he's describing liberty as, uh, it's. It's, the, it's the, these legal loopholes that uh, people use, and yeah, they may find you know more more personal freedom and all that good stuff. But you know what happens when the state figures out that uh, you know there's a way around that? Well, they create more laws. Uh, so that that's that's what he's uh, saying when he says uh, large scale use of liberty. On the other hand, tends to reduce liberty, which I, I, I would I would guess what he's saying is that it, you know it increases uh, increases the number of laws. Or maybe perhaps, uh, maybe a slightly more accurate way of putting it is maybe the law of unintended consequences. So when you do yep. have things, and maybe this is, maybe this is a, a new concept for some people too, but maybe perhaps when you have legal interstices like a Bill of Rights, for example, when you have something like a, le like a Bill of Rights, that is arguably a type of legal interstice. And unfortunately, as, as even people who are advocates of, limited, of a hypothetically limited government very well can appreciate, even if they may be in denial in some ways, is that uh, over time, even if you set up a government that ha does have a Bill of Rights, over time that Bill of Rights gets eroded and eroded and eroded and eroded to the point where any sort of expected legal protections or interstices and so forth really become subject to 
there's even a, even a Wikipedia article on this, but legal abuse. And, and thus it just gets eroded and eroded and eroded. Sometimes it'll be done very quickly with like a particular court decision or something, but other times it'll just slowly erode over time through little tiny central planning tweaks where they're endlessly tweaking everything to death. Um, and the next thing you know, in any functional real way, which is what Rayo's talking about, because he's, he's more of an engineer. I think that was a little bit of his background. Yep. Um, what actually happens in reality is that, yeah, on paper, you may have, according to any Bill of Rights, things like free speech and the right to keep and bear arms and, you know, a, a protection against unreasonable search and seizure and to not be tortured, cruel and unusual punishment, et cetera, et cetera. On paper, that would be your legal interstice. But in reality, if there are things uh, such as being subjected to various infringements ranging from censorship of one kind or another to gun confiscation to warrantless searches to being extraordinarily renditioned and tortured, those are realities, even though the piece of paper says something different, uh, completely different. And I think that Rayo was trying to very succinctly explain the relationship between Vanu and liberty is that liberty is you're relying on the pieces of paper, laws, constitutions, bills of rights, etc., as opposed to Vanu, which is about practically exercising your freedom in the real world using a variety of methods. Exactly, exactly, and, and, and well said. Yeah, you, you definitely explained that a lot better, a lot better than I did. So uh, I think there's uh, one, more, one more quote, and I think I actually dropped this one in here for, for show prep, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and read this one because I have some interesting you know, uh, comments on this one. So, quote, I suspect that any kind of liberated society is inherently unstable. In the general absence of institutionalized coercion, people will lose self-protection capabilities and become very vulnerable to institutional coercion, providing fertile ground for growth of new and for a while, especially vicious states, end quote. Now, we'll get to this in future episodes, but he had some, some choice things to say about anarcho-capitalism uh, back whenever, uh, whenever he was around. And... You know, obviously, this uh, th this would apply. I would say, uh, if you consider like the the tyrannical growth of even the United States government, uh, once that once the Constitution, the 1787 Federal Constitution was, you know, kind of in place, and and and, and you know, uh, uh, people were a lot better off than they were in England and and, and all of that. I feel like they, they like they, there's just this this complacency, uh, and I think that's kind of what what Ray is explaining here. Uh, people lose self-protection capabilities and become very vulnerable to institutionalized coercion. Uh, so when that happens, I mean, it, it's very, very easy for states to continue to grow. Uh, or, I mean, th this could even, yeah, again, this could even kind of relate to, to anarcho-capitalism too. Uh, and obviously, I, I consider myself a voluntarist and uh, an anarcho-capitalist. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not against, you know, critiques of, of the ideology that I adhere to. But uh, you know, maybe maybe the same thing could apply there. Um, just kind of ra raising raising the maybe maybe potential concern. I know this is this has been quoted by some folks or, or attempted to be quoted by some folks, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this could happen in in, in Ankapistan too. When when uh, you know the protection agencies that are so often you know referred to, Kyle. Uh, maybe maybe this the same sort of situation would would uh, you know come to fruition in, in, in an inner capitalist society too. I don't know. I'm I'm just I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Well, to keep this as brief as possible, because this is an introductory episode, all I will say here for now in passing is simply this. You're right in saying that Rayo is primarily concerned with complacency of one kind or another, whether it comes from people who advocate a limited government position, as well, just as equally, the people who advocate a no government position. So Rayo wasn't, in that sense, so ideologically concerned, he was more concerned practically in the real world. And just to be clear, Rayo was no utilitarian. He did care about natural liberty, uh, our rights, uh, you know, pre-existing government and so forth. I mean, that was also kind of very clear. Uh, but he didn't really, if, if I'm interpreting this right, he didn't come across to me anyway as seeming to care very much about um, a lot of these, like, some, and Shane, maybe you've seen this too, a lot of people will have, like, the, the pseudo-debates of one uh -huh. kind or another, where they go over so, over so much nuance and minutia that would even make mainstream academic philosophy teachers kind of roll their eyes in terms of, okay, I think you're splitting the fine hair of the fine hair of the fine hair, 
ultimately leading to a distinction without a difference. And I think the distinction without a difference, I think, is what Rayo was kind of concerned about yep. when he was pointing out that the limited government advocates, the minarchists, as well as some of the no government advocates, the anarchists, were committing some types of forms of complacency that were actually more similar than not. And that, I think, is what he was concerned about. Indeed, indeed. And, and one thing, uh, kind of just to move forward, move forward here, uh, one thing that will come up, uh, especially in the action part, when we kind of look at what, we, what Rhea was doing, uh, is something that's, that's more commonly known as survivalism. And even back in his day, he, you know, he had, there's a, a back, back and forth conversations, debates between publications and, 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 and all that good stuff. Uh, but uh, he had some, some interesting things to say about uh, survivalism and, and how it kind of applies uh, you, you know, to, to Vanu and how others are practicing it back uh, in those days. So do you want to read that, Kyle, or do you want me to? Um, I'll, I'll take a swing at it. Okay. Um, okay, so this is Rayo talking. Quote, the retreat concept, as set forth by Harry Brown and Don and Barbara Stevens, means disaster insurance. Preparations to survive an expected future politico-economic disaster without substantially altering one's pre-disaster lifestyle. This is not the same as self-liberation. A change in lifestyle is not predicated on coming catastrophe. While a retreater and self-liberator may use some of the same techniques, their attitudes and general approaches are different. I am here concerned mainly with self-liberation, close quote. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that, that's a very very good point. And even even today, uh, I mean, you look at uh, some folks. Uh, uh, I mean, there's some listeners of a of a certain certain guy, uh, pretty huge, uh, uh, Infohorse, and uh, he has people buy a lot of uh, you know uh, survival survival foods and and, and you know like uh, various other survivalist uh, you know uh, uh, materials, so to speak. And uh, uh, you know, get your radiation. Yeah, get your nuclear radiation detector today. Just uh, it's you know get it for yeah. uh, 1995 plus shipping and handling. Yeah, yeah, but the, the, I would say probably 95 percent of those folks aren't have. There's no change of lifestyle. It's just it's just you know habits. Uh, and and I think that's what 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 Ray is definitely emphasizing here is the you know just kind of uh, some of some of these things these th some of these things do overlap. But what Ray was really, really promoting is the, the, the change in lifestyle, not just, you know, uh, taking some of these precautions and continue to uh, continue to live uh, within uh, the state of survival society, which, you know, we'll, we'll get into later on in, in various podcasts. Yeah, exactly. And so I think it's very important for people to keep in mind that although it is true, much like Rayo said, the techniques will be similar, so more specific techniques. And many of the uh, people who identify as preppers, the original term is survivalist actually, but it's arguably the same thing. But even the self-described preppers uh, would uh, do things like the food storage, water storage, a firearms battery, having a bug out location, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All Rayo was saying is that, yeah, we'll do a lot of that stuff too, and, you know, plus off-grid homesteading, there's that whole kind of thing too, right? Uh, we'll, we'll do a lot of that stuff too, but our motives and our attitudes are completely different. One concern I've always had with the preppers, not so much the old-time survivalists who seem to be actually pretty okay for the most part, but, even, but the more newer like preppers, like within the past five years or so, a lot of them, Shane, have been really fear-driven and was actually the inspiration for why I wrote my article on rebutting the concept of doom porn because unfortunately a lot of the prepping circles have kind of devolved into that where it is really as Rayo kind of explained it the, the disaster insurance type thing with oh the what you who's it's gonna collapse you know it's like oh the economic non-collapse that never actually occurs right because remember the dollar was supposed to die in 2010 and I think we're recording this in what year 2017 I think I think it's hard to find that out nowadays. <laughs> yeah, so so the predicted disasters either don't happen or when they do happen it's usually some small local thing like like some sort of storm somewhere or a hurricane Katrina. Oh, there's a dated reference. Or a hurricane Katrina or or something like that. But generally speaking it's not like the apocalyptic end of the world. The world is on fire either literally or metaphorically. Generally speaking, you know, the grid is still up. The Federal Reserve notes colloquially known as the American dollar, is still functional. You can go pay your bills and, and be paid it in and, and so forth, get, buy groceries, for example, gasoline and necessities. 
Uh, and uh, the internet is still up. That's how, what we're doing right now, right? Network computing. Uh, so all of this basic infrastructure is still working. So the predicted disasters of, of some preppers and all that have, you know, the, the time frames have, been, have come and gone. And now what? And I think what is valuable is that regardless of whether certain disasters either occur or not occur, the more important issue is even if, let's say, it never happens and everything blow, uh, you know, <laughs> trudges along as it always has been, uh, the statist quo, let me put it that way, uh, basically it doesn't really matter in the sense because what really matters is not some distant future hypothetical thing, but what really matters is the here and the now, today, even tomorrow and next week is what matters, not some future Mad Max scenario that probably will never actually end up happening in all honesty. And I think that's what Rayo was getting at. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I meant to get to this earlier, kind of skipped over it here, but I think it'll work. It'll work really well here as well. Uh, kind of what you've just mentioned uh, uh, towards towards the end of, of what I'm going to read uh, that will kind of tie in uh, just a little bit. Uh, but also now that you've gotten kind of a, like a, a, a basic understanding, you know, what a, a, a tenuous grasp per se on you know what Vanu is and what it isn't, I think kind of taking a look at you know uh, Rayo himself. Uh, and, you know, I think the, the, this article by uh, uh, Benjamin Best uh, titled Tom Marshall Innovator, A Week in the Wilderness, I think that'll give you a little more, a little better of an idea of who the who this individual was that uh, was was formulating and pioneering this uh, freedom strategy. But Kyle, uh, when you're talking about this uh, in prep, uh, you mentioned that there were a couple of potential, you know, concerns that we should bring to the listeners attention before uh, before we uh, before we read this article. Uh, why don't you go ahead and mention those? Sure. Now, Benjamin Best was in a position to know certain things because he claimed to have uh, contact with Rayo directly and, and personally and such. My concerns are are mainly this. Um, you know, his narrative just kind of does kind of jump around a bit. And I guess that's perhaps understandable because he's acting as a firsthand eyewitness. So I guess in that sense, it would be like arguably akin to maybe like, you know, people's uh, eyewitness statements and, and with other things. And maybe that makes sense. But Benjamin Best did admit that he was distracted by a particular woman uh, who is also there at that, uh, I guess, I guess you could say an informal seminar or workshop of sorts that, uh, Rayo was conducting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he was getting really distracted as a man would uniquely be distracted by a woman. And I do want to keep this PG 13. Um, but, but suffice it to say, he was distracted as a man would be by a woman. And he went into some detail, uh, even in the, uh, <laughs> almost like R rated, uh, maybe not triple X, but you know, uh, he, he was all, let me just say, he was very, very honest about how distracted he was getting. And, um, I, I think that may, that plus some other things he mentioned in the art in his article, I think may have colored his view of Rayo when he was describing certain, uh, idiosyncrasies that may very well have been true, but he was portraying it in very pejorative language and certainly not anything neutral uh or, or certainly not anything favorable much less neutral yeah yeah and uh i i'm not gonna read this entire article i'll put the link to this in the show notes as well so if you guys are interested you know uh i i think i pulled the most important parts out of here uh but if you want to you know read the entire thing you, you can definitely do that uh but for the purposes of time this is a seven page article in a pdf so uh, i do i do respect your time and uh want to you know give you the information that you, that you kind of need at this point uh in the vani podcast so uh, again benjamin best this was published in the august 1987 edition of liberty magazine i think this is all something to bring up too kyle this published in the 1987 edition rayo disappeared in 74 was it yes uh so obviously uh that the time frame i don't know when this was when this was originally written, but I would imagine if it was published in that uh, in, in Liberty Magazine, it was probably around the time of publication. So, I'm so the time fact, the time factor might actually be at play here. You might not be remembering things exactly correctly. Right. But, but again, there's there's that. there's no way to verify that. But I, I, I uh, maybe he wrote this, you know, the week he came back, and and you know just submitted it there randomly because he saw an article in there about Rayo because there are other articles. Um, I, I don't know. There, there's that that factor as well. I absolutely agree with you that it, it is suspicious as all hell. And I think that also casts a doubt of, of credibility. So you have the the time delay of, I think, well in excess of a decade, right? Between the time Rayo disappeared yeah, and years. when 
Yeah. yeah so so what what was Benjamin Des, what, what was Benjamin Best doing in the meantime? Was he getting distracted by other women? I mean, I, I don't want to get too much into conjecture, but it's an open question. And also, you know, and even I, and I was kind of scrolling through here really quickly, but even some descriptors of Rayo's character that Benjamin Best was was using, for example, quote, uh, an acutely fear filled uh, fear filled individual who lived in constant expectation of nuclear war, economic collapse, social chaos, and a totalitarian state. Uh, elsewhere, he says, uh, "Oh, Rayo had quote political paranoia and inhibitions in social situations." Now, yeah. I don't know about you, but even if that was true, why the pejorative language, almost like corporate media in a lot of ways? I've seen this kind yeah, of thing why, before. Yeah, why, why put it in, in a negative light? Like yeah. if, you're, if, you're, if you're describing a person, uh, and like in, in situations like, and I wanted to mention this too, I mean, uh, obviously, yeah, we've raised some concerns about this. There's just no, there, We've raised some concerns about this article in particular, but there's just not a whole lot on Rayo. And this is, this is one of the only ones where you actually may be able to get some sort of idea. I'm sure there are some grains of truth in there. Uh, so we just want to make sure they it's that I mean just just hear just hear it out um, as as Colin and I both have done and I, I think it's an, an interesting read and maybe you know some sort of an insight into into Rayo himself. But, he, but, but Benjamin Best so colored it with his own opinion too, which is kind of a problem as well, which is what you don't want firsthand eyewitnesses to something uh, to actually do, or or if they are, keep it really minimal and preferably go for not even necessarily like friendly, but 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 neutral. Is, is kind of the baseline here, and he, and he didn't even do that. So, you know, it's kind of questioning, I mean, are there ulterior motives uh, here? I mean, one of my articles was basically on, you know, chilling dissent, how the government demonizes Americans, and I'm sorry to say, but, you know, I think Benjamin Best is one or two steps away from calling Rayo uh, anti-government or radical or extremist or domestic terrorist or some of these extreme unfair unjust, pejorative, and outright demonizing, really slander, libel, defamation, uh, assails on his character. I mean, Benjamin Best is sounding more like the corporate media, or shall I say, de facto state-run media, than he is sounding more like a libertarian, or, or even somebody who's just neutral. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's uh, um, maybe yeah, I think that that's definitely accurate to say. Uh, I guess one other thing before getting started, and I found this out tonight, and we'll get more into this later on. Uh, but but I mentioned that uh, Konkin, Sam Konkin, the uh, you know the the founder of Agorism, might have been influenced by Rayo, and uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's definitely possible now. Uh, Konkin's mentioned in publications, and also uh, he's mentioned he's mentioned Rayo specifically in publications as well as Vanu. And when when I start reading this article and it kind of goes through the history, uh, he was you know out there in you know California where a lot of you know the libertarians at that time were kind of congregated. Uh, I think George H. Smith spent some time out there, and a bunch of other folks like that was kind of the you know the, the Russell and bustle and libertarian community, so to speak. Uh, so you, you'll you'll get an idea of, uh, of Rayo's background here. But uh, again, I want to keep this short and just kind of highlight the most important parts. And I think the uh, Rayo's background, uh, or you know, Tom Marshall, as I mentioned in the article, uh, I think that will will be beneficial uh, for you guys. So quote: I first met Tom Marshall in Los Angeles in 1967. A tall, slender, and bespectacled electrical engineer, he was in many ways a picture of what is commonly recognized as a nerd. He was what she might call inhibited and at a loss for small talk. He had an element of formality about him, even in ca uh, casual social situations, but it wasn't severe. He was much more at ease exchanging information or making plans for action. He spoke in what sounded like a dialect he made up himself. Every word was carefully articulated, but spoken with unusual inflection and variation and rate of speech. It was contagious. I have occasionally found myself, uh, Benjamin Best is here speaking, obviously, uh, speaking the dialect without intending to. I remember he once used the phrase, sort of, somewhat inappropriately, in a way I thought was an effort to conform to what he saw as my hip orientation. Imprecision was not a part of Tom's natural self-expression. He lived in a rundown part of the city in a shack that looked as if it were about to be condemned. The furnishing was sparse, and the grass was long, yet he was not poor. A more pleasing aesthetic environment would have been a waste of money in his view. Tom was born and reared in New England. He once told me that one of the great resentments of his youth was that his father, whom he held in high esteem, spent years trying to establish a local public school rather than expending his time and energy on giving Tom a private education. After working as an engineer in the Bahamas, Tom arrived in the ideologically seminal atmosphere of Los Angeles in the early 1960s. 
Harry Brown was at the Henry, Gen Henry George School. Joseph Galambos was promoting concepts of competing governments with an emphasis on deference to intellectual property. And the Nathaniel Brandon Institute was teaching Ayn Rand's objectivist philosophy to a wide audience. Tom enrolled in an MBI course, Nathaniel Brandon Institute, but his prime interest was applying ideas uh, and achieving personal freedom through experimentation and direct action outside of the political process. His initial effort, Preform, was the first instance of someone attempting to form a new libertarian country. He attracted many intelligent, capable, and cre uh, creative people to the project. To expand his base of human resources, Tom established the Institute for Social Progress and began to publish Liberal Innovator, which was intended to document instances of people achieving economic, social, political, and sexual freedom. Although the word liberal was soon dropped from the title, Innovator continued monthly publication from 1964 until 1968. It was fresh, exciting, and creative. But Tom's urgent desire for freedom was drawing him away from Los Angeles. He published Preform Inform to document his gypsy lifestyle as a camper nomad. Then he published Vanu Life when he and his freemate moved off the roads and into the wilderness of Oregon. In the spring of 1972, I visited Tom again, this time attending his Vanu Week program in Oregon. What follows is an attempt to reconstruct my memories of that week. I must admit that personal and psychological factors stand out in my mind more strongly than technical details. So I'll pause there for a second. Um, obviously, uh, Kyle, do you have any, any thoughts on, you know, his background growing up or, uh, I mean, uh, just right there, um, uh, right there and kind of what we were discussing before, quote, what follows is an attempt to reconstruct my memories of that week. So I think that kind of verifies yeah, that the, the may have been, uh, may mm -hmm. have been a little, little, uh, you know, a little, uh, Little in, the, little in the past, little in the past too. But uh, yeah, and any any thoughts on uh, Ray uh, on you know Rayo's background growing up? I mean, it, it, it's it's interesting to see him place like in the, around the same time as you know some of the uh, some other folks who have kind of pioneered some things like like Honkin with agorism. Yeah, I, I think Benjamin Best is kind of not so subtly trying to say here that he's biased. Yeah, I would I would definitely. So I I, I automatically view this as a credibility problem. So. Although some of his observations might have a grain of truth to them, like you were explaining to the listeners a moment ago, uh, the problem is that he right here, you know, more or less in the beginning is like, you know, hey, this isn't 100 percent. It's like, oh, crap. And it's also kind of like, again, the time frame, which you brought up. Why did he wait a decade? I mean, that's just suspicious as all hell. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 definitely true. That's definitely true. So, um, yeah, just uh, just a little bit to give you an idea of what Vani Week uh, uh, was, at least in, uh, uh, as as best can recollection uh, uh, recollect it. So, uh, quote: Tom mailed a list of code names corresponding to actual names of creeks, roads, and other geographical features of the area where I was to meet him. He later sent out a description of how to find his rendezvous spot, which made reference to code names. I had some trouble finding the initial turnoff and considered inquiring at a local store. Uh, Len, who was his freemate that, that Kyle was mentioning before, suggested that we would not be a, that would not be a very Vanu thing to do. So we ended up driving around a bit more until we convinced ourselves of the correct turn. Later, when I mentioned my difficulty to Tom, he made reference to the store where I could have inquired. Uh, uh, I also had trouble driving 1.6 miles down the road with a car whose odometer had no tenths of miles. I ended up driving in circles to zero uh, the thing in and then trying to estimate. By following a treasure map type, so type series of pacings and turns at various con uh, codenamed landmarks, we managed to be at the rendezvous spot at the prearranged time. Tom whistled a prearranged tune from the bushes, and I whistled a prearranged tune in reply. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Kyle, see, like that's a very, I mean, even at that time, I would say that was kind of, you know, like a, a revolution, like, a, I, I don't know if that's the right term, but uh, definitely, you know, pioneering security culture back, you know, in the uh, 60s and 70s. Yes, those specific techniques would fall under uh, the, the more modern term of security culture. Yes, absolutely. But I also want to keep in mind, and since this is the introductory podcast, that although security culture is definitely part of Vanu, Vanu is much broader than just security culture. So just please, uh, listeners, just keep that in mind, at least until we get to the episode where we get more into detail on those kinds of things. Indeed, indeed. And uh, I'm going to skip uh, day one. You guys can go check that out uh, in the show notes. But anyways, uh, on day two, Roberta, Tom's freemate, came to tell us about foots. Tom and Roberta use a division of labor to some extent in the cultivation of their Vanu skills. Tom worked on the construction of the shelters, while Roberta worked on nutrition and the preparation of foods. Although they recognized that this was in keeping with stereotypical social roles, it was nonetheless quite satisfactory for both of them. And uh, skipping ahead just a little bit, on day four, Tom came to tell us about camouflage. This involved a lengthy and insufferably boring, 
Lexer demonstration of camouflaging our polyethylene tent by covering it with a tarry substance and then sprinkling pine needles, leaves, small sticks, etc. on top of it. I have a sense of Tom lusting. I'm just going to skip that part. That's not that's not relevant. That's nope. uh, that, that's that's in regards to uh, uh, to Mr. Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Best, Best being right to himself being distracted by a woman like only how a man can be distracted by a woman. Yeah, let's just skip over that. Yep. Yep. OK. Quote, our, our campsite was on the borderline between public and private land. Tom suggested that in the event of being discovered by park rangers or private owners, one could say he or she had intended to camp on the opposite side of the border. Tom also had a very sharp eye for planes. When one passed overhead, he would tell us to hit the cover. He suggested that we go for a nude, uh, for nude walks to help develop Vanu's self-consciousness about planes and possible confrontations with people from that society. Len, again, best freemate, seemed to like the idea. Now I curse my. Okay, I'll skip that part too. Okay. Sorry, yeah, this, yep. that, that's, that's why we had the disclaimer a little bit ago. Like, Benjamin Best, is, he keeps getting distracted. I don't know what else to say. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> back, back to the article. Quote Tom also gave us a few cock and bull stories, which we could give to park rangers if they came upon us. They seemed so ridiculous, I didn't bother to remember them. I don't think he had much ability to identify with the psychology of park rangers. And skipping forward just a little bit, uh, I asked Tom many theoretical questions. These were matters he dealt with only in print, he said. Meeting with libertarians almost always dealt with questions of nuts and bolts. I remember asking him about the problem of the vanishing wilderness. I also asked him why a person who avoids human contact should have such ideals for social relations. He replied that in a big city, people can move from one person to another until all of these persons get wise to his or her game. But Vanuans value their relationships, which are necessarily few. He said the ultimate basis for his libertarian morality was his desire for the best possible relationship with Roberta. I asked about him and Roberta having children. He said it would be too dangerous in a community of only two, but in a community of four, one person could safely be pregnant. So Kyle, before I move uh, forward, is there anything you want to uh, want to mention so far? Well, I think the comment about uh, Vonowins value their relationships, which are necessarily few, I think that kind of runs in the face of the whole uh, fascist book experience where somebody can have 20 million different so-called, quote, friends, which really are just at most contacts or very loose acquaintances most of the time, or just people that they just clicked confer the confirm button on, but they've never actually, like, shaken their hand or, or, or otherwise know them in any real way, even if it's just, like, phone calls or something. Um, yep. So I, I think I think there is that, um, but yes, I, I think I would agree with Benjamin Best that the uh, the d desire of preferring quality over quantity, I think, is a very key and true, accurate descriptor of of the relationships that Vanuans have. Yeah. Uh, so quotes: uh, We went for a swim in the local swimming hole. We all stripped naked. Roberto was the first in the water. Tom bragged about the high durability, and, and again, Tom is Rayo. Uh, uh, Rayo bragged about the high durability and comfort of his shirt, which he had found in a public dump. He also made remarks about liber libertarians and hippies being alike in their practice of nudism. Tom had practiced social nudism prior to meeting Roberta or breaking with that society. So I, I think that's an interesting note, too, and that'll kind of, I mean, that'll be something we'll discuss in a later podcasts, I'm sure. But uh, uh, bragging about the high durability and comfort of a shirt he found in the local dump. <laughs> well, hey, that, I mean, that's, that's Freeganism, which, of course, I'm also the same guy that wrote A Primer on Freeganism. So you, as, as people can kind of start understanding, there's all that Vanu can have a lot of overlap with certain types of techniques or other things like dumpster diving, as is the case here, and such, without uh, without betraying uh, like the hard and fast principles of liberty and and so forth, and that I think I, I love that example about him, uh, you know, bragging about the the shirt he got from the, the dumpster dive or whatever, and and which I think is accurate regarding the nudism. I do want to make an aside on this. Everyone, just please keep in mind, Rayo was practicing, developing and birthing and practicing Vanu during the 1960s and 70s. So it's not so much that nudism is part of Vanu. I don't think that's quite an accurate way of putting it. It's more that nudism was just kind of like a countercultural thing at the time, more broadly. And, and Rayo was just simply trying to see if he could kind of experimentally make it part of Vanu. And again, maybe that itself should be its own episode, perhaps, at, the, at some point in the future. But just in passing for now in this introduction, uh, please keep in mind that it was probably more of a, uh, of a countercultural social norm. 
Yeah, yeah, that was exactly my thought too. So yeah, I'm glad you glad you uh, glad you said that. Uh, uh, back to the article. We're almost we're almost there. We're almost there. Just a couple of couple more segments uh, excerpt or excerpts to read here. Quote: We were allowed to visit Tom and Roberta's base camp. Something definitely not in the schedule. It was a large polyethylene tent on flat ground. I only vaguely recall their famous foam bed. Roberta outdid herself by the preparation of a variety of tasty Vanu foods, including forms of candy. Tom conceded that one of the hardships of wilderness Vanu is the absence of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Considering they ate a great deal of stored food, I asked Tom if he had enough money to live in the woods indefinitely. It's getting to be that way, was his reply. Uh, so, just, so just two two things there. Uh, and th like this is uh, obviously Vanu is is far more expansive than just you know going out and moving in the, in the uh, moving out in the middle of the woods and then just disappearing like Vanu did. But uh, if that's something that interests you. I uh, just, I mean, just something basic, you know, that, that Rayo admitted, you know, just, I miss ice cream. Uh, like that, like those, those things, um, those things, I mean, they, they, I guess they, they could kind of get to your, your sanity and, uh, out in the middle, middle of the woods, wouldn't you say, Kyle? I guess there's always a risk of, of getting what cabin fever. And again, that would be more appropriate for a future episode, but I do want to point out something here rather important that we'll get into again in future episodes, given that this is an introduction, which is quite simply this, that portion where uh, I asked Tom if they had enough money to live in the woods indefinitely. If anything, that's almost sounding like what has now become known, and I believe this was part of your direct action series, what mm -hmm. could be called financially independent early retirement. So as you can see, and I hope the listeners can really appreciate this even more, Rayo was a pioneer in, in many different directions, which a lot of people today in the alternative media might be familiar with one particular component or a different particular or a different other technique but rayo uniquely was comprehensively combining all of these different things in such a way so that he could enjoy a well an invulnerability to coercion or at least as close to invulnerability as possible which had never ever ever at least at least in terms of the literature ever been done before Indeed, indeed, he was—he uh, was definitely, definitely a pioneer. And that was the second thing I was going to mention. But yeah, you—you you, you handled that one uh, better than I probably would have. So, a uh, good deal. Yeah, just a little bit left. Quote, and this—this this, kind of gets into more of what, uh, uh, which, what you were mentioning before I started reading. Um, but uh, uh, and especially in terms of like the survivalism and the retreaters uh, that we covered just a moment ago. Quote: Tom's intense rationality and, and integrity are what inspired those who knew him. Even his seemingly irrational fears had substance in the later 1960s when nearly everyone had a sense the world was changing radically and quickly in unpredictable ways. America was at war in the hostility of China and the USSR made nuclear holocaust a real possibility. Many were looking for a way out. Tom stopped publishing Vanu Life in 1972, evidently in part because he was tired of, quote, libertarian bullshitters who were all talk and no action. I continued to correspond with him until early 19. 74. So that's all I have from that article. Uh, and again, we've mentioned, we've already mentioned the disclaimer, so there's no reason to go over that again. But, uh, uh, you know, with, with a lack of literature, uh, I mean, obviously we, we've got the book, Vaughn of the Search for Personal Freedom, but obviously he doesn't talk about himself. Uh, so it, it's nice, even if, uh, even if, uh, you know, some of it's false or maybe even most of it's, you know, incorrect. Uh, it's, 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 I don't know, Kyle, it's still nice to, you know, maybe like get a, get a peek into uh, who Rhea was as an, as an individual. Well, and considering the, the sheer lack of literature, just cumulatively, the fact that, uh, you know, you and I have been able to revive and, and save what literature could be saved is, is kind of, well, in some ways is in many ways a miracle all into itself. And I, and I hope the listeners can really kind of appreciate that, that in essence, we're trying to, um, revive something that I think has efficacy if people would only, uh, you know, give it a chance. Oh, I, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. So uh, let's begin to wrap this up here. And I, I want to, and, and, and I've mentioned this very briefly uh, there in the introduction, but what is the goal and the purpose of the Vani podcast? What Kyle and I are, are doing here? Well, I guess first and foremost, a revival of Vani is an ends, uh, an ends, a means, and an insight. Uh, additionally, Vanu shares the same baseline as voluntarism, you know, the ideology that, that I, I, I'm completely okay with, uh, you know, anti-political libertarianism and strategic withdrawal, but it goes much, 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 much farther. 
uh, one of, I guess, not not necessarily a critique, but just something of voluntarism is lacking. That uh, I know I've, I've I'm, I know I've discussed, and also you have too, Kyle. Uh, but it, it's kind of you know a prescription of what you sh what you can't do, not necessarily what you you know should do. Uh, so, Vani goes a lot a lot uh, definitely a lot further than that. But uh, Kyle, any thoughts there? Yeah, just let me just make a note here about voluntarism briefly, just so just a little bit of a compare and contrast so people can understand what we're distinguishing out here. I would say that voluntarism, your your ideology mainly, is the real libertarianism. It's the real one because it's inherently anti-political. It's it's anti-state. Uh, it's against the notion of statism and so forth. And so therefore, uh, and we'll cover this in a future episode, uh, but things like political crusading, reformism, working inside of the system in order to change it from within, all of that stuff is automatically excluded for reasons we'll discuss uh, in the future. Uh, for for very for very good reasons, uh, as both as matters of uh, tactic and tactics and strategy, but there's also the principles behind uh, voluntarism, where it's you know, hey, you know, we don't need to ask people permission for you know our our freedom or liberty, if you will. Uh, you know, it's it's ours for the taking. Always was, always will be. The only question is to what extent are we willing to tolerate infringements and that perceptive change, which kind of captures the spirit, maybe not exactly, but at least the spirit of like the old classical liberals from centuries and centuries and centuries ago, like John Locke and so forth. And what I like about voluntarism is that it kind of kind of crystallizes a lot of what could be some of the classical liberal uh, failings in some places and tries to crystallize it in a very simple, easy to understand way. But as far when it comes to action, though, and performing or direct action and real uh, or as the Austrians would say, human action in the real world. The voluntarists do, uh, or at least the consistent ones anyway, uh, it's, it's all about strategic withdrawal, right? And, there's, and that's a whole other topic unto itself. But unfortunately, it, it, they just promote strategic withdrawal, but then that's it. And I personally, you know, I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. On the other hand, I don't think that strategic, I, I, my concern is I don't think strategic withdrawal is going to be enough because, no, of, because, of, how thi not. because of how things are, because of what much like even, even a 16th century uh, jurist like Etienne de la Boetti said, you know, people, you know, voluntarily subject themselves to authority, to the state and so forth because it, it works for them or, or they falsely believe that it does, you know, superstitiously and such. So when it comes to the rest of us who actually do truly know better because we actually understand human nature, we understand property rights and, and many things related to those kinds of things, um, yes, there is strategic withdrawal, but I, as a Vanuan, honestly view strategic withdrawal as like the baseline, that that is the very minimum, minimum that ought to be done by any of us who care about freedom or liberty in, in any sense of those words. Indeed, indeed. And I was going to mention Etienne de la Boetti too. Now, now, like, I, I guess uh, on, on the flip side of this, so to speak, if 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 uh, you know uh, um, the majority of individuals, you know, just uh, just refused authority. I mean, that would be one thing, but that's un that's not the, the the world that we live in today. And again, Vani was you know about reality and uh, and and what can be done now. So. Properly understood, Vanu is a is more of a libertarian strategy and less of an ideological philosophy unto itself. It is more concerned with doing rather than just philosophizing, which is something that you kind of just mentioned there, uh, mentioned there, Kyle. Uh, so the Vani podcast seeks to build off of the foundation that Ray left and then advance it further. Now, obviously, there's a lot. Of, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's happened since 1974. So there is more than plenty uh, of material for us to cover over the course of this podcast. So uh, I guess uh, let's move forward to uh, uh, concluding thoughts. Uh, what, what do you want to, uh, I guess, leave the listeners with, Kyle? Well, there was one notion, and this comes straight from Rayo. He, he would often say, function determines form, means determine ends. And so going into these future episodes that we'll make here for this series, that is something that I want to kind of stress to everybody is that Vanu does share with other libertarian strategies like agorism a firm insistence on integrity, that it's not just the the ends you want to achieve of 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 a you know of of, a, of actually experiencing something resembling freedom, but it's also the way in which you go about achieving it. Because not all paths you know, in the in the normal libertarian parlance, not all paths to liberty are equally valuable. 
or shall I say equally efficacious in the, in the sense of them working practically in the real world. So that's something very important. Function determines form, means determine ends. Yeah, yeah. And uh, unlike, uh, unfortunately, something that I've seen within, uh, and, and, and hell, even Rayo talked about this, you know, uh, at length in, his, uh, in, in, the first, in the first section of the book. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, there is there is something such a thing as like an anarchist politician. Obviously, that's in quotes because it's contradictory of terms and all of that. But anyways, there's there are such thing there are such things as like anarchist politicians and anarchist voters. Uh, but there there's there's literally uh, if if you if you look at uh, uh, and, and we'll get more into this uh, later on or if or if you read the book in the meantime. Uh, I mean, yeah, he's completely against all of the, you know the 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 political crusading, the bullshit libertarianism. Uh, the political version. So uh, yeah, there, there's no, there, there can be no such thing as a Vanuan voter or a Vanuan politician. Like that is, that like anarchist politician is bad enough, but Vanuan politician, it just, it's just, it's, it's, it's essentially like just. And not similarly, <laughs> and similarly, there is no such thing as an agorist politician. There is no such thing as an agorist voter. And to be perfectly straight here with with the terminology and such, there is also no such thing as a. Uh, voluntarist politician or a voluntarist voter. I mean, I'm sorry, again, function determines form, means determine ends. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Indeed, indeed. So uh, I guess uh, uh, anything else, Kyle? I, I would just simply say that uh, I hope people will seriously consider uh, learning about Vanu and, and see if it's something that they want to implement in their own lives. Indeed, indeed, and there's so much more. <laughs> there's so much more. We, we've got the first couple of months, uh, actually, just the first month, Kyle, of, of, of podcast kind of planned out, and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, again, there'll be a, there'll be you know a, a handful, maybe less of uh, you know the the groundwork for for this uh, for this strategy. But uh, once we get into the action, uh, it's going to get uh, real, real interesting. Uh, but you got to You got to get the, the you got to get the groundwork. You got to get your uh, uh, you, you got to get your your introduction to it first before you can. Uh, uh, begin actually putting into practice. So, uh, well, thanks uh, so much, guys, for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next week for uh, number two. Where we'll be discussing the compatibility of Vanu with various anarchic schools of thought, and we'll also compare and contrast the direct action between Vanu and uh, other various schools of thought. So, uh, thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.